biography and all the good parts of this book, um, I want to relate a little story. My good friend, Minister Simone Pollard, I was giving couples advice to my daughter. Um, last November, got married. She had a COVID wedding. And Simone very wisely told her that a strong, a strong marriage is based on a few tenets. One of them being, don't hang out in the dirty laundry for your neighbors to see. And I thought to myself, I said, well, that's where all the good stories are. <laughs> <laughs> so it gives you the idea of what this book is about. Um, anyway, really quickly, this is an elevator pitch, and I probably, many of you have heard this a few times, but I'm going to run down a brief background on my mother. Um, born in Milwaukee, 1915, in the middle of World War I. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is a very conservative town. Her grandfather was a painter and etcher and had a printing company and encouraged her to be an artist. If it weren't for him, she wouldn't have gone to Yale Art School, where she was not able to graduate. She went four complete years, but they flunked her final painting. And the story about that is in here as well. There she met my, our father, Paul Fontaine, and they married in 1940, and they spent their honeymoon year in the British Virgin Islands. What a great place to spend a year. In a shack. So she came from, you know, middle class, upper middle class Milwaukee to living in a shack in the British Virgin Islands. And she talks about sitting on the throne of her bathroom, the toilet, whatever it was, <laughs> and looking out at this beautiful sea. She's the best throne ever. Um, a room with a view indeed, right. So our older sister Carol was born at, in Worcester. Um, when they returned from that year, by the way, Yale paid for our father. Our father won an award as the, the leading painter from that class and paid for their time in the British Virgin Islands for the entire year. So then they came back to Worcester to buckle down and, and work, and the war was breaking out. And um, that one year, they actually built a studio together. And once again, mother bootstrapped it and built right alongside my father and this, our father, this um, studio that they hoped to live in. But our father was drafted and was part of the Corps of Engineers in, in Italy. And when the war was over, there weren't enough folks to come back. So he telegraphed our mother to say, why don't you come over? We'll be in Paris for six months. It'll be great. Well, they ended up staying 25 years. So this book is a lot about that first few years about what it was like in Germany, because it went, went from Paris to Germany. Um, and she immediately fell in with the artist and collector, Hannah Becker, and, a, and Hannah Becker was, has an amazing story, there's also a great biography about her as well. She um, almost single-handedly was protecting the degenerate artists in Berlin, which continued to show their work a little have been easily um, put in jail. And after the war, she knew where they had hidden. They had left the cities and gone to the southern part of Germany. And so mother had a car, mother had gasoline, mother had alcohol, cigarettes, <laughs> and, and food. And the two of them traveled around Germany, um, and she mother photographed them. Photographed them, bought their art, encouraged them, and did what they could to bring, to bring back to life. So, um, I'm going to, that's pretty much it, that after the 25 years of Germany, they did 25 years of Mexico, and that's a whole other story as to how that happened. So, just for today, I'm going to just read a little bit of, from, this, this book, by the way, is my mother's writing. I am just stitching together her letters, her diaries, I fill in, I did some research to see if something was really true here and there. Um, also, background information on some of these people. There was over 400 people that showed up in the letters and diaries, and I made this massive index because what do librarians do? They organize things. <laughs> so I organized and have this um, index that, and the Fontaine Archive is meant to build community. It's meant to build, to find the children of these wonderful people that my mother associated with, and maybe there's something in the archive that could be of use to them or be interesting to them. And so I've been through the quest of our father's book, where I actually did have a, a need to find people who had his art, I would find their children. But now it's even, it's even a bigger picture because there's so many, and 
and it's really a wonderful thing to work on. So I'm going to read just a little bit here. Um, one on page 35, working at a gun munitions factory. Just sort of give you a sense of what her, her voice is. It's pretty strong. I do not wear slacks because I look awful in them. Oh, by the way, these letters are to her mother. She wrote to her mother once a week. At least once a week. And I have a good, we have the good fortune that when um, grandmother died, all these letters were sent back to our mother, and mother kept them. So I, we have letters from the 30s all the way through to the 80s. So all of her time at Yale, everything was documented. So in the first person. So I do not wear slacks because I look awful in them. And it would be a bother to change back and forth to them since we have no dressing room. I wear old clothes, an apron, a nice one you sent me, if you don't mind, and an old pigskin glove to protect my right hand. I take it home to wash every Saturday night and sew it together again because I always file the finger seams apart during the week and then start filing my fingers off one by one. Some fun. The girls are supposed to file the parts perfect, but they don't. So when I inspect the finished work, I have to file away what they missed before I can pass it. In fact, I had to let a girl go this week because she was a punk filer <laughs> and was holding up production and came to work drunk the first night anyway. Boy, we get some pips sometimes, but they don't last long. <laughs> well, there's another one that's a good one, too. This is to Mary Schenk, who was one of her colleagues at Yale, who became a Broadway, actually won awards, Grammy. Costumes. Dear Mary, this is April 29, 1946. Dear Mary, well, I've just finished cutting a cord of wood for the day to keep myself warm. I'm still seething over your remark about me being an old house friend. But how could you know? Any more than I had a way of knowing that you had gone right to the top with your chosen career. But wait till you hear. The difference is that I am not a bit surprised about everything that you have done, and will doubtless do. Whereas I have been living in overalls in the woods on a mountain for five years. You can probably tell me what Maine West needs for breakfast, but I can tell you how to put in a septic tank, lay roofing, build a fireplace, lay flooring, or build a whole goddamn house for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> and in between working in Worcester and doing this for the studio, she also was put back and forth to Milwaukee and stayed with her mother and could help take care of Carol. And our mother would go to the Milwaukee Art Institute, and there became good friends with the woman named Holly Cohen. Nampton later on went to work for Frank Lloyd Wright. So then she goes on. When I told you that I did promoting in a small way, I mean, I meant artists. While working at the Milwaukee Art Institute in the winters, Holly Cohen and I put on such good shows that I guess we both got out of town before the good people chased us out. <laughs> Stuff was floating, flying, and doing all kinds of things. And train loads of Chicagoans and others out of towners came to see what was going on. And the beer town got a new name for itself with its modern art shows. I only work for the artists whom I believe in. And then this last one, or second to last, is when she arrives in Frankfurt and in September 46. So she had just left, she's been there barely a month. She's writing this to herself. I don't know, if, or maybe she intended to send it to somebody. Subject, report from Germany by a wife of an American civil service employee of the U.S. Army of Occupation. There's an expression used around here a great deal which goes something like this. Boy, I've never had it so good. Ad nauseum. But this writer, sad to say, has never used this expression and is not likely and knows the reason why. She is the wife of a civilian. The Army of Occupation is terribly understaffed and are so anxious to sign up XGIs and civil service personnel to fill vital openings. And then what happens? First, the civilian family goes to an embarkation camp near a port in the States and lives in army barracks for a week. Then she is put on a ship. She is treated pretty good on the ship because she has a child. That rates a cabin above the waterline so the portholes can be opened. The only drawback is that there are 40 other mothers with kids in the same cabin. <laughs> 800 toller in the ship. For 12 days we live like this. We are fed well and don't complain. We can't when there are hundreds living below us. In the bowels of the ship, some having hysterics and yelling for air from the broken ventilating system. We don't say a word. At least we know we over soon when we reach our final destination. What is it? It's full of drama. And then when she finally 
page 55. So if you don't know the story of the Linus men, their main job was to find the art that was stolen by the Nazis and restitute it back to the museums for more it was stolen. But of course, that much, much art is stolen from individuals as well. Mother looked at it more like, let me help the artists that survived. So sometimes she got in the way of what the Linus men were doing. And they thought maybe she was doing things illegally. So there's a few of these little lines that she had. But this is a description of the first day there. Yesterday, with my pal Gladys, I bundled up in the field coat, snow boots, and stumbled down to the Baden building to catch the, 19, the 915 bus to East Baden. Zero weather, bright blue sky, sore shoulders, strapped with three bundles, one of which was a package of painting boards Paul had found for Otto Oster, the first modern German painter I had found. An hour later, we arrived at East Baden and hiked over to the Lundes Museum. The two MIP guards, MP guards, military police. The two MP guards we had talked to on our last visit were still playing cards in the sparsely heated entrance room. The German receptionist, bundled in a big sheepskin coat, struggled from behind his desk to reach the inner communications phone, and soon Frau Kohlbutt came through the inside door to greet us. I explained to her in German, that's the one thing that she said, that she loved German in high school in Milwaukee, and actually has been used. I explained to her in German that I had paint material from Alo to leave in her care. She left the room and returned shortly with a written permit for me to go to her office. This was handed to the guards, and I signed in a book and then followed the woman through the door, down hallways, empty galleries, rooms stacked with old masters, and eventually to her spacious, book lined office. Last Sunday, a very fine exhibition of Christmas pictures was opened to the front galleries. Choice works by Altdorfer, Caravaggio, Rembrandt, Captain Edith Stanton, recently transferred director, and Mr. Billabel, the new director, who came from the Mabo Collection Point, brought hand for the opening. Our small party of four were the only other Americans on hand, which gives you an idea of the interest shown by the U.S. occupation forces. Otherwise, the galleries were filled with bundled up, enthusiastic Germans. In four days' time, the pictures on the walls began to buckle and warp, and the show must close works go back into the warm storage. So I also want to say, this, besides her letters and your diaries and such, I throw in a few sidebars of my personal perspective. And also, I try very hard to see if I can get anybody else's you know, writings about you know, good or bad of what they thought of our mother. And it was not easy to find. But I did, at one point, call an old classmate who happened to be 96 years old. And this was 20 years ago. He's unfortunately passed now. I asked him, and it wasn't documented, but I simply asked on the phone, well, Leon, because they all went to Yale together, Leon, what was, what, what was mother like? What was the problem? Why did they not graduate? And there was this long pause. And we said, well, she is difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is sort of, this is an old piece from my perspective. I knew her as a mother who held my head when I was sick over the toilet, but also as someone who did not play with me. She would not make cupcakes for school or encourage us to have slumber parties. She had her own parties. I made my breakfast and lunches as soon as I could reach the stove and make oatmeal and boiled eggs or slice dense German bread with a hand slicer. She signed me up for horseback riding lessons, but would not stay to see my progress. At age 11, I was expected to ride my bike for five miles to the stable. When the horse threw me on my third lesson, I never returned. She, she did send me to her seamstress for sewing lessons during the summer of my 12th year, to which I rode the bus. One of her sayings was, a clean house is a sign of a misspent life. <laughs> <laughs> my sister does not like that at all. That's not the way to live. <laughs> and this one last piece here that um, I was, was written by Mother's best friend, who actually was with her the weeks before Mother passed away in Mexico. And they were best friends since 1948. Mother passed away in 1991. She had been a journalist uh, for the Paris Herald Review. And I had written a poem, and the poem in the book as well, uh, from our mother's 75th birthday, where I sort of described all the different things that she meant to us. 
one and so here's what Yvonne writes back to me after the funeral. Say yes to any offer of a trip or an adventure, quote unquote. Hits me with a sharp and poignant nostalgia. It was a jitty quality that will bring back her voice and a buoyant spirit to me as long as I live. When we first met in Germany more than a generation ago, the warm and beautiful Ginny taught me to open my eyes to all kinds of people and places. She could walk into an artist's studio with her generous smile and energy, and a whole world of action and reaction would take place, as though the artist realized he was being appreciated for the right reasons. And he would open up, show his work with pleasure, open his mind to her with any ideas. He was harboring. It was a rare quality and made all of us want to follow her whenever she beckoned and wherever she went. Thank you. I have to write the book now. <laughs> 
I mean, I spent 20 years just fooling around with indexing and making sure things were scanned and helping people that emailed me, but then I said, oh no, I've got to write the book now. So that's what's really started. That was in 2017, four years ago. Yes? What was your mom doing in Worcester? So in Worcester, she was building the studio, um, helping raise the Earl's daughter, and, and then she, there were some artists that wanted to, um, I should say, artist friends, old friends of hers would um, take her around to different art shows and such, and then she also decided to do an art show of our father's work. So on her own, she developed a show that traveled to 11 different museums, of course it's six, something like that, a lot. And he, she had our father take, send over the watercolors that he was painting while he was at war. And it was called the War Watercolor Show. And it went to Kalamazoo, Chicago Art Institute, Milwaukee, a few other places, um, Indiana. And that was her first one. She got her chops in actually building the show. And in Milwaukee, she actually worked at the, the, the museum. And so that helped a lot. But uh, in Worcester, she actually worked on getting the show together. And it was difficult because she didn't like her talk very much. <laughs> so they were hard on themselves. So. Why are you doing that? You're supposed to be taking care of this little girl. Yeah, it's hard. Yes? Um, with my modern mind, her story can sometimes seem a little bit sad, even tragic, in terms of her path as an artist. Was that her interpretation, or did it become something no, else? No, no, she, she, she at some, many times would say, well, it can't be more than one artist in the family. <laughs> and she sort of like, that was it. And so she turned to photography. So, and even though she was often rejected, her articles were rejected, you know, she, her photography was not taken into, a few did, a few, you know, so she had a few wins. She was a photographer for a modern dance company, Mary Bigman. Mary Bigman was sort of the equivalent of Martha Graham in Germany. And um, she photographed them at the, uh, for one of their, their big events in uh, Montreal, Switzerland. She was with them for two weeks solid. And that actually got accepted with Dance Magazine. So she had these little wins. So it was like a little engine that could. She kept on trying. But I would say it was inspirational. Yes? Did she just relay anything over? Was she proud of all her accomplishments? Never said a word. Never said a word. It wasn't, it wasn't until we actually we got the photo album. We, we played around and looked at this photo album quite a bit. But I had no idea who these people were. I mean, we heard names going around here and there. But yeah, and the way it all ended in Germany was kind of like, so um, she, when she went to Mexico, she was kind of dumb. And she had a bit of a drinking problem, too. So she had she was common among the generation. Yes, yes. Yeah. Martini went with every conversation. <laughs> yeah. Well, her Yale, the Yale Art School, which um, had about almost equal equal between men and women, and then um, when I when I saw that she didn't graduate, I said, "Well, I wonder how many others did graduate." And then, but then there were a few that did, so it was about half. But a lot of it, you know, many got pregnant, or you know, said they couldn't go on, or whatever, and do other things. Um, it's not something I want to throw in their face, but it was. It, I know this.
and, and the fact that she could help because she had Hannah Becker to guide her to where to help. Because it was, it was pretty broken. I mean, the cities were bombed. And she doesn't talk about that. She, just, she says a little bit here and there. Except for her, uh, her photographs. And her photographs. Thank you. 